at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA CDM today. Wentz, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, if you've been around for the last 10 minutes while we've been yakking on, trying to work out what we're doing, thank you very much. Um, today we've got Sue Viskovic again, our first return guest. Am uh, I? Oh my gosh, I'm so privileged. Yeah, it was very exciting. And we're talking about what's the topic? Something about business plans and what we're doing in 2017. Sue wrote a blog on LinkedIn about the four things that you must do in your business in 2017. So let's get stuck into that. Thanks for coming, Sue. My absolute pleasure. So first question, what was the thought process around writing the blog? Uh, well, you know what? If I'm totally honest, see, see we're already just uh, taking all the covers off. When I was on leave over Christmas, I had it in my, my intention to go, yeah, well, I'll write another article about business planning because the new year's starting. It's like, you know what, I've done that for the last three years. Everybody's talking about that. Oh, the year's finished and we're doing a new beginning. And then January kind of came and went and I went, you know what, it's actually more, hopefully people have heard the message enough now that they are actually planning. It's more now around what are the things that I reckon every business should have on that plan for this year because we are just every business is experiencing a lot of the same challenges and, and it was actually a bit tricky because usually these articles are hard for me because I can't say every business should do this because you know one might be having an issue with staff at the moment one might be having an issue with I don't know exiting practice owners or succession but I definitely when I really sat and reflected on it I think these four things are absolutely relevant to everybody so hopefully it's not too late and they can look at their business plan and go yeah, actually, I need to have a little bit more think in this particular area. Awesome. So I, I had a read, read of the article, um, but Good. can you briefly give us an idea of what the four things are? Yeah. So the overarching element of the whole thing is, hey, you know what, you should have a plan. And, and before I go into the four things, I just want to clarify what I mean by the business plan. So... I know I bang on about this all the time and different people have different uh, definitions of business plan. So I'm not talking, <clears throat> I'm not talking about your operational plan where you do a full, who are my competitors, you know, everything from the ground up, like when you're doing a startup, I'm talking about your tactical plan. So for the next 12 months, what are we going to do to achieve what we want in the business? And those that have seen our staff, we have a one pager. We call it an evolution map because it's about going, where is the business at the beginning of the year? What am I starting? What's my starting point? So what's the revenue? What, you know, what are the qualitative factors? And what do I want to achieve in 12 months time? How much money do I want to be making? What sort of profit? What do I want to get my expenses to? How would I want to describe the business in 12 months? And then what are the actions that I need to do or the strategic directions as we call them to get from point A to point B? documented, single page, which really is just the manifestation of the fact that you've sat down and put some conscious thought and energy around where you want to go in the business. So four things. Um, number one is having a real reality check on your relevance. And I know we bandy about the term client value proposition an awful lot and quite frankly, I'm bored with the term, but it's really, really important. So what what is it that you're trying to build as a business and what are you doing for your clients? Why are they coming to you? What, what, what is the, the outcome? What are the outcomes? What is the value that you're providing to people? And that could be anything from I'm the person that they turn to when they just don't know what decisions to make. So I'm that voice of reason and, and that authoritarian person that can help guide them in the right direction. Or I am, and I know you had Sandy on last week, I am the investment guru and I'm going to manage your money better than anybody else can. Or, you know, I am the educator. You know, I know that you're in a place with, in your life where maybe you're not making some great financial decisions and I'm here to empower you to move beyond that. That is really so important more than ever before i know it's always been relevant but more than ever before and and this is also about taking a reality check so really being honest and and take all the um self-limiting uh protective mechanisms that you might naturally have and just taking a really honest look at what you do and how meaningful and, and valuable you are to people 
That's too long on my summary, wasn't it? Number two is technology. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so, and we can dig into these. I'll just get them all out there. So technology is pretty straightforward. Don't just fall into the trap of saying, well, we pay so much money on this system and it's the one that everybody uses and I should keep using it. Um, and, and, you know, this audience is probably um, more evolved than most when it comes to utilising technology. But, you know, if we drop in Zapier, um, the ability to use really good software systems, have them talking to each other. If you're spending money on a piece of software, make sure that it's doing what you want it to do and that you are driving it, not the other way around. Pricing model, more than ever before, again, it's always an issue for businesses and, I, and as much as we are an expert in this space, I've yet to meet a business that we can honestly say they've got their pricing right and it will stay right. It is a constantly evolving thing in any business and, of course, at the moment we now know that you've got, well, 10 months now until the LAF comes in. Um, so part of it is around looking at what you're going to do about pricing risk. But if you have been taking upfronts in your business, we've actually found a lot of advisors that are uh, full scope advisors and they're shocked to find that if they remove the upfront commission that they get on the risk component, they're actually not going to make any profit on their overall advice component. So now is really important for a lot of businesses to take a good hard look at their, their pricing and how they're working that. And then the fourth one is take time for yourself, focus on you. Um, particularly in business, a lot of us just get so caught up in just running it day to day uh, that they forget about self-care, about, you know, being mindful, having time for what the point was in starting a business in the first place. So there's absolutely no, no um sense in having a business that owns you and you don't see your kids at night or you don't have kids because you don't have time to meet a partner or whatever it is you don't get to go fishing or surfing or all the different things that you love because all of a sudden this great thing that you started to be a business is now owning you and you've got no nothing left for anything else because unless uh yeah unless you've got that um that time for yourself and that uh ability to to look after yourself then you know the business is uh not going to fulfil you. Awesome. You so I've got a, I've got a tricky question. I know you spent a lot of time on this blog, uh, and you've really thought about the four things. But I'm a busy advisor, busy business owner. I've only got time to really nail down one of those things. What should I prioritise as number one? Oh well, you know what? That's a tough one to answer because it depends on where your business is at now. So I would go through the process to go, when was the last time I looked at my CVP? At, do I, am I absolutely convinced that I'm relevant? My clients love me to bits and I have no issue winning clients when I find them. And if you can tick that box, then you move to the next one and go, when was the last time I really assessed the technology that we're using in our business? And you'll know, honestly. I mean, if you spend any time, even if it's a subconscious thought while you're doing something else, you'll know what's been niggling at you about, about your business and, and whether it's achieving what you want and whether it will continue to achieve that as the world changes around you. And then you'll be able to determine that. Pricing, you know, if you Pricing is a really interesting one because it's partly around the quant aspects of it, but then there's actually a whole, and you know, we talk about the art and science, there's actually a whole mindset around pricing as well. And if you maybe are still challenged by asking for what you're worth or not totally believing in, in uh, what you're worth and maybe you want a different profit margin than what you're getting but you don't think clients would pay, just depends where your head's at as to whether that's something that you want to focus on. So, and, so the uh, answer is really, cost. you don't know, whichever is the worst in your business. Yeah, yeah, and I can't well, answer I, that. I want to pick out that pricing one, Sue. If, I know you deal with a lot of practices with a lot of legacy or uh, legacy setups around pricing and a lot of um, different styles of businesses. Yeah. What yeah. would you do if you started a practice today? What, what would your pricing structure be? How would you do it? Would you take commission? So it's funny because there's, there's actually two different businesses. If I were to start an advice business right now, there's actually two different ones that I would start, right? And they're one extreme to the other. So the one is the full relationship model where, where it's almost like a life coaching side as well as a, a financial advice side. Um, and if that were the case, I would look at doing a couple of different elements in terms of price points. I would definitely be a flat fee. Um, 
I would definitely get a scalable investment solution to handle that. So I wouldn't be positioning myself in saying the more money you've got, the more money I'm going to make. It's more around what I can do to help you create more and manifest more in your life. The other side is more of an education piece. So that would be more of a membership site, um, a really low cost um, model. Again, it would be a flat monthly recurring um, amount. The commission model would depend on the two options in terms of which one I would take. If I were to be at the lower contact end, lower relationship end, where it's more one to many, 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 and it's more of a placement service and a facilitation service as well as, you know, some customised advice, that would probably be, I'd have to run the numbers, but I might even go the level commission model on that, if not the hybrid with, a, with an advice fee attached to it when it would separate out the implementation side from the advice side. If I was going the full relationship model, you know what, I, I would probably have a crack at going no commissions whatsoever on, on, um, on anything. Great answer. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, pe people do get caught up in our commissions right and everybody has a different view on that. And, and that's what I've found in working with so many different businesses. It doesn't matter what my view is personally, but it's about what's the business owner wanting to achieve and what's important to them. And then I know all of the different options that they can employ to make that work. Um, the biggest thing is just be honest. You know, don't hold yourself out as saying, oh, I'm going to be holy in the now and, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be completely separate and then actually I am getting a volume bonus from something somewhere or, yes, I'm actually influenced by this. And so just, just be true to it. All right. So awesome. Everyone watching, just if this is your first time watching, uh, you can throw out questions for Sue. She will uh, answer it throughout the time or at the end we'll make sure we we counter audience questions. So your next point in the article or point number two was about technology, having a good hard look at your technology that you use. Mm. My question is around how, and I'm, and I know Patty and myself are big culprits of this. How do we move away from the shiny object syndrome where <laughs> we see that yeah. new technology and say, this is going to rock my world. It's going to change my life. It's going to yeah. totally revolutionize my business but we spend hours, hours, hours into it. And then by the time we're almost okay. executing on it, we look at the next new thing and we, we start to implement that next new thing. How do and we move on from that? Yeah, yeah. And that's absolutely a trap because everyone's talking to you about, oh, there's FinTech and, oh, you've got to start with the latest, greatest stuff. You don't. It comes down to knowing what is it that I want this thing to do for me. Sometimes you don't even know that you wanted something until this new shiny gadget came out. Um, and you know that I, 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 have, I love the term about what a lot of advisors have. And well, actually, I don't think it's just advisors. I think it's entrepreneurs that you have ADOS. It's like, oh, I've got attention deficit. Oh, shiny. What's over there? And it's, it's, it's not just oh, in technology. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think a lot of us have got it. Um, no, I think it's about saying, well, we'll identify first what are the gaps in what I'm doing and what's taking me too long and what am I doing that's costing money for me and my client that is not actually serving my client and then I want to find a solution to, to fix that. Um, and then I think being really disciplined, so sure, be open to what other stuff is, is happening out there and new products being launched and all the rest of it, but when you look at it, Take a real cynical view of it and say, okay, what is that going to do for me that I cannot do right now? What benefit is it really going to bring rather than just being, oh, look at me, I'm so cool, I've got the latest thing. What is it physically going to achieve for me? And if you can't articulate that really well, just don't even start going down the path of exploring it further. Um, if you can, then great, check it out. Don't listen to what it can do. Test it to make sure it does do and it will do that for you before you, um, before you implement what about on the um, open architecture side of things, on integration and uh, its ability to, that's often how I filter things out because you can see things that look very similar and you, one lets you connect with other things, others, and the other one's a bit more yeah. closed. And you know what, I think just about everybody in financial services has had the specific experience with a big software system that tries to do everything itself and doesn't play well with others and it's difficult. So yes, I'm a big believer in making sure that it is going to be open. You can have an API talking to other things and you have your software doing the things that it is really, really good at. And then you plug in the other bits that you need. But also that, I mean, that's just one side of it. So it's still, 
still comparing what, because all of them have different functions. So saying, is that a function that is going to work for me? Because it might be great for somebody else, but I'm, it, that's not relevant for, for what I, the purpose that I'm going to use this particular um, piece for. Hey, there's a great question in the thing. Can I just jump back to that from Dylan? Hi, Dylan. Um, what are we seeing out there for average initial advice fees for aged care advice? So that's great. And thanks for sharing. So Dylan's saying he charges two and a half to three and a half K purely hands off. Advice is what if scenario and outcome based only. Um, that's a great question that I'm going to have to hold on because we are about to go live next week with our next um, pricing advice data gathering so we have our pricing research that goes out every couple of years we're about to start the fourth edition so you will see all the links and hopefully you guys will all click on it um, and we're digging into a bit more about specific aged care advice in that the last research that we did it really only got caught up in the um, limited scope advice and I don't think that was really specific enough um, but I do know not that this helps that a lot of advisors are challenged by the aged care pricing model. Um, of the anecdotal evidence I have of the advisors that I speak to and those that we work with, probably sitting around that, but maybe a little bit more. So the average is probably somewhere between the three and four K. And I've got to tell you, if there's one thing I can say about the aged care advice, if an advisor is looking at it from the background of an asset-based model, and this is not to say that's bad, but it's just where you've come from, you, your natural instinct is to identify your price point in line with the amount of money that the client has. Whereas, so they might say, oh, well, this client's only got 200K left by the time they go into aged care. Where in actual fact, that client's got some issues around family, wanting to access more funds from them. They, um, you know, don't have anyone that they can trust that much. They've got a couple of different options in aged care service providers that will make a massive difference to them. And so therefore spending for thousand dollars to get that advice and making this decision right because it's they're going to do it once and they don't want to be moving aged care homes after they've moved into the first one they really want to get it right and so the value in providing those services is significant and it has very little correlation with the amount of money that that client has you might say yes but i'm going to take four thousand dollars at their last remaining two hundred thousand but if they don't get good advice for you they might lose an awful lot more than that by structuring the wrong way or going to the wrong provider or having dodgy family members that do bad things. So there you go. That's my point on aged care. So April, I will have a lot more hard data around that. So, yes. Oh, there's lots of questions coming through. I've got to... Awesome. So just, just sticking on pricing models, I um, mm -hmm. think it's a good idea to survey your clients um, about pricing models. Oh, it's a tricky one because I always kind of... You know how you often see this research where people say, oh, consumers think they should pay $600 for advice or that's all they're prepared to pay. I think that's just a lot of garbage because they don't know, they don't know what's being offered. If someone said, what would you pay for a car? You'd go, mm, I only want to pay this much. But there's such a variety of what they do and, and what they'll provide for you and all that sort of stuff. So surveying clients is an interesting one. Um, everyone's probably always going to say, if it's a price point, they're probably always going to go with the lowest that they possibly can do because if they want to influence you, then that's great. Um, from a model perspective, yeah, I think that's good. It's great to hear what people think because we sometimes we overthink it, right? You know, we get so involved in commission or asset-based or not and, and maybe that doesn't even, maybe that's not even important to the clients that you're working with. So, yeah, I think that's, that's a great idea. It might be better to do it in conversation, though, or phone kind of interviews because yes or no answers on that kind of stuff from an opinion perspective might be a little bit difficult to draw out really great insights from them. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I just got Shane Hayes. Um, he's talked about going flat monthly fee from get-go, and I know that's what Phil does. And he's thrown in a bit of the tax deductibility piece. Um, I was at the AFA Gen X uh, session this morning and I know Mark Bynum specifically mentioned, I guess, that as part of their agenda to get that tax deductibility status for all fees, which would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, my, my answer to the where do you go to, there, there is some good stuff on the ATO website which sort of makes it, as long as you word it in a certain way um, and it, it's linked to revenue generation, um, as long as you can articulate that and be convincing that it's linked to revenue generation is generally the... Um, yeah. I, I don't know if you're going to think to add to that too. 
Yeah, uh, look, uh, most of the advice that we tend to get is it depends on the accountant of the client at the end of the day. You can you can word your invoices as best as possible and, and your service agreements accordingly. Um, at the end of the day, the, the liability or the, the decision comes to... Um, comes to the accountant. So yeah, that's a great point. Dylan Counton said if it's invoiced to the client direct and client as consulting slash wealth coaching and connected to the income making, it's okay, they'll put it through. Um, yeah, I think go to the ATO. That's that's the stuff that Mark's talking about. I mean, the, the sooner we actually get a, a proper ruling on this and, and the ambiguity is removed, that's great. Um, most advisors I find are saying, you know, they, they, they position the invoice Voicing on the ongoing component that it's it's going to be tax deductible. I will make one point to you, Shane, and, and it's probably something that's relevant for, for, well, hopefully it's relevant for everybody. You make the point there that you don't want to take the fee from the client super if you can avoid it. You want to pay it, have them paying it out of cash flow. Just don't fall into the trap of, of trying to have a blanket rule for everybody from a... Um, I, I guess from an idealistic point of view, and I don't mean that in an offensive way, but it, it, it's saying I don't, I want them to know that they're paying it and so forth. They're going to know that they're paying for it and you're going to disclose it. I just think take it for the client. So if you're running their cash flows, if you're looking at their financial position and they really don't, you know, they would be better off using that spare cash flow to pay down their non-deductible debt and use this, the money out of super to pay your fees. Just, yeah, don't, don't have a mindset before looking at it on a case-by-case -case basis because you might find it's 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 less of an issue that than you think. Well, the other thing um, you've got to be conscious of is the sole purpose test as well. Yes, yes that's exactly right. Precisely. Now, I wanted to ask you guys a question. I flip it. So yeah, the, whole, the, <laughs> the whole article is based on the premise that people do write a business plan, right? And Phil, you just said to me, I'm too busy to think of four things. I only want to think of one thing. So, honesty time. Have you guys got a business plan? So, when we <laughs> asked you to come on, we didn't allow you to ask us questions and challenge us. So, I don't know, was that a, a communication issue that uh, oh. allowed you Maybe to do? Jackie said something. I don't know. No, yeah. no. So, you still got the answers no. I am yet to write my business plan for 2017. I have an overarching plan, um, but to be honest, what my, my number one in my business is uh, your point number four, don't forget about you. So I run my business um, to um, spend time with my family. Um, so I've, you know, I've got three girls and, uh, and I make sure that I'm working four days a week um, because of that, because I started my business so I can um, have a lifestyle business. So that's that. Uh, is already ticked off in my business plan. Uh, but in terms of all the quantitative stuff, uh, you know, what revenue figures I want to get to, I haven't uh, written that down as yet. And right. I was being... And I noticed some people... I'm putting you... I'm putting you guys in the hot seat, but I'm also asking everybody else. So start putting your comments in there, guys. I can't look eye to eye to you, but put your yeah. comments. I'm, I'm genuinely... Yeah, so not just to have a crack at you. Yeah, my, my business plan is so dynamic. It hasn't even made its way to paper. Um, it's just continually evolving, sir. So it's, uh... <laughs> that, that's, that's a yeah. no if I've ever heard a no. <laughs> no, I know. So funny. So this is the thing, right? As a person who, yeah, he would be a good politician, wouldn't he? Um, <laughs> as a person who works with businesses all the time, I get it. You know, I know you're busy. You, you don't want to stop and think about it. And I love um, Mark's answer here. I hate sitting down to write my business plan, but I get excited when I write it and then I get depressed when I review it for the first time 12 months later. So <laughs> it is a discipline, but I've seen the difference that it makes. And you know what it comes down to? Forget about the words business plan. All it comes down to is taking the time to really put some, oh, here, I'm going to get juju, mindful awareness on what it is that you're trying to achieve from business. And you're absolutely right, Phil. Your highest um, uh, outcome is that you want to only work four days a week so that you can spend time with the girls. That is awesome. I would then go, and how much money do you want to make from this business? And what else do you want to achieve for your girls or for your family or for yourself and work backwards from that and then put some numbers around it, set your intentions at the beginning of the year and then actually keep yourself um, accountable to them because otherwise you'll get 12 months later and go, this is really great. I did spend my four days a week working and that was awesome, but I, I actually didn't achieve some of the other things that I could have done. 
and it's just stopping and doing it. Oh, thanks, Despina. I like this lady. She said the best thing to do is get a mentor or a business coach. They don't have to be expensive to make you accountable for your business plan. <laughs> Totes correct. And if I run the stats, so the business health, don't just listen to me with my anecdotal evidence. Business health have got it all the time, although I am quite heartened to see that the numbers have increased. So it used to only be about 28% of advisors. It's now 41% of advisors have a, a, a documented business plan. Um, and it has 130% impact on profit margins. So those businesses do, that do have 130% more. And seeking external advice quarterly, 62% uh, said that they did of the people that did the business health survey, which was really interesting. I think a lot of them have got a PDM who made them do the survey, but that's okay. 108% <laughs> impact on the profit for those that seek external um, coaching or advice. So you and set this up, didn't you, with Despina? You set that up. <laughs> now you know what though it's a really it's a really good point and it's something that we've changed in our business as well because for years I've been going well it is expensive to have us one-on-one -on -one in a business I mean there's there's no, no doubt about that um, but we also know the value that we provide and so the businesses that pay us the two grand a month are getting you know 10 times that at least in the uplift but we're now introducing more of a, a lower cost outcome that can say you're still going to get a really good uh, result in the business by having that person that you can speak to and keep you accountable without necessarily, um, you know, having to, to go whole hog. But, you know, whether it be a PDM, whether it be, it is hard to keep yourself accountable because you get busy and you go, oh, I know what the figures are going to tell me, so I don't actually want to look at them, so therefore I'm going to avoid them. <laughs> but um, I'm, really, I'm really interested to help people put some attention on this for themselves. I, I mean, I, I love hearing the reasons why people don't. And usually it is exactly, oh, I'm okay, but um, I'm getting what I want. And then you still get that, or oh, oh, maybe I should sit down and take a little bit more time and just plan it out. Well, so is there anything that you can, um, if, if people wanted to go and check something out now and just go, shit, I'm just going to go and write a business plan. Would you suggest anything that they go do um, to kick that off? And oh, my goodness. This is like we did set this up. Yes, I would suggest something. So so we <laughs> created um, <clears throat> we created a piece of software called the Juice Console. Uh, and that is actually, uh, it, it steps people through with video and without a physical coach with them, steps them through the whole process to figure out what it is that's causing them pain in the business and then creating the one-page plan. So, yes, they can go and get that um, from our website. Uh, to be honest, at the moment, I'm not very happy with the speed of the software. It doesn't do things as quickly and as fabulously and magically as I want it to. Um, so I was thinking about this, talk about Spur at the moment, I was thinking about this on the way here. If people are serious about accessing that and they, they're part of the XY Live community, then send me an email and I'll give them 50% off. Joe's going to kill me. So that's a monthly subscription fee. Retail's 220 bucks a month because there's a lot of stuff in there. And you guys can get it for half if you want. But you have to email me. I haven't set up a big thing because I don't do this very often at all for people on Juice. But, yeah, email me and I'll, I'll get it, give it to you. Otherwise, you can look at our blog too. We've got some um, samples of this is what you want to put in the business plan in terms of that one-page template it's really quite simple. It's nothing, you know, where are you now? Where do you want to be? What are the things you're going to do to get from here to there? So fantastic plug, Sue, and thank you for your generosity. Um, <laughs> I'm impressed by the plug. I'm, like, I didn't even know <laughs> I was doing it. Oh, no, I know that you died. Are you? <laughs> and and you're, you're plugging your services. I love it. Always a salesperson. It's really good. Hey. Um, what, I know. I think it's good. What what you uh, provide the advice community is so valuable. So you know, wow. selling that is not an issue. Going back to doing business plans, how how do you see um, someone if they're not if they're a tight ass advisor um, and they don't want to and they don't want to pay for a business coach? Um, how do you see the best way to develop your own business plan? Do you see it as um, you know, spend an hour a day for a week, um, you know, cutting it out of your calendar and, and do the business plan or just block it out for half a day and write it down on the one page uh, evolution map. Um, what, what do you see the best way to do that? So, I, again, I, it would depend on the way that you work. If you are disciplined enough that you've got that hour blocked out and you know you're going to do it, 
great. And then it also means that you've spent some time thinking on it and then when your focus is on something else, something little subliminal might pop up and you'll just jot that down and come back to it. Um, a lot of people, though, do find that they will always find something that will get in the way because uh, they just, oh, I've got a few phone calls to return. Or, oh, I just haven't finished, you know, proofing that SOA or whatever it is. Um, we, again, talking from our experience, if we work with a business, we find shutting down, shutting the door, turning the phone off for a whole day so you can have 100% focus on it is really effective um, so doing that with yourself is good. Again, as long as you're disciplined not to then go, oh, I'll just make this one call and all of a sudden it's 11 o'clock and, and you haven't done it. If you've got a team around you, in fact, while I'm talking, if everybody on, can you just stick a number in the chat box and send it to me just to let me know how many people are in your business because I don't know if you guys are all just on your own single person or there's two of you or there's ten of you or whatever two, two, three, keep going guys, just keep going and all. So if there is just the one of you, then then yeah, the time to sit down, talk out loud to yourself, do whatever you want or have a partner or someone to help ask you questions. Um, if you've got a team, it's a really good idea to actually get them all together. So you'll know what you want to achieve for the business, but in terms of how to achieve it and the things that you want to fix and improve, there's a lot of value in getting your, your, your peeps on board to help you figure that out. And, of course, they're going to be the ones. So we've got a good mix. They're going to be the ones that will actually be implementing the plan as well. So you want them involved in it. Right. That was a, that was a good question. Um, Dylan was sort of talking, it's sort of back to the fee um, space, about mm. when you give insurance advice and you get the unexpected drag on and extra work that may come out of a client. Have you seen, do you have any recommendations on how to deal with that or have you seen any good um, ways people deal with that, that extra work that goes in that effectively, if you don't, ch if you don't charge anything, you're losing money on the case? Uh, yeah, so I think when, you, when you're positioning your ongoing service fee, be really clear on what it does and doesn't include. Um, and some of the best ones I've seen is where you, you set it as being, this is a retainer, these are all the things I'm going to do for this fee. But if we find that something significant happens in your life, then we want to reserve the right to be able to charge for it at that time. And by doing that, it means I'm not going to have to inflate your fee every year just in case something happens. I'm going to be able to keep your fee at a reasonable amount. So then if and when you need a little bit extra, then, then we'll only charge it for you at that time. Um, what about for the, the others just said for the upfront for the upfront space. Oh, okay. So are you talking, sorry, I've missed that one. So are you saying for risk or are you saying? Yeah, for risk advice, but when, you, when you're doing some upfront and then um, it's it might be a $3,000 case if you're taking commission and it ends up being a whole lot of work that goes into it. Yeah. So this is where I think the advice fee is really powerful um, to be able to position at the outset to say, look, the advice for my services and the implementation of those of that advice are two separate things. So I charge a fee for providing my advice and suggesting to you how you want to structure it. Um, and if you want us to implement it for you, then we will... Um, take the hybrid commission or whatever. And as part of that advice process, do a pre-underwriting questionnaire. Um, you're not always, like, especially if they're not going to be honest with you and maybe they don't know about some of the medical issues that they've got, but in nine times out of ten, that's going to raise some red flags. And so if you find that, yeah, they've got a high BMI or they've got lots of family medical history, you might then position to them to say, look, I'm, I'm, you need me more than ever. I'm, I'm prepared to go into bat for you and find an insurer that's going to give you the best cover that we can in taking into account these factors of your life. The challenge with that for me as an advisor is that um, is going to take a fair amount of time. It's incredibly valuable to you and I really want you to get covered, but this might take a bit of work. And then position however you want to do it. So you might go, um, we will take the commission, but if it takes more than 12 hours or whatever to do the work, then we reserve a right to charge a fee or we'll let you know when we get to that point or we're just going to charge you a fee whether you get covered or not and so you can make that choice but in order to do that we're then going to if you get it we're going to give you the 25 percent discount ongoing which means that you're writing the product on nil commission um yeah there's there's a few options and and you might even just do it on a case-by-case -case basis only roll that out if you do the pre-underwriting questionnaire and there's some um some scary looking stuff in there 
Does that help? I'm saying that there yeah. are some. I, I like I, Dylan's sort of come back and you can do as much pre-assessment as possible, but um, I guess at the same time, as long as you make sure you warn them and say that if there is something that pops up, um, that that's, that's going to be the case. It's sort of, uh, yeah, and the hours bit as well. Um, yeah. That's a good way to position it. So Dylan's got another question around percentage-based fees. Um, he's got some clients who are that higher end, you know, 1.2 to 2 mil uh, worth of fund per client. Yes. And he's looking at how do we, how does he cap his, his percentage-based fees? Um, so, and, and, and he made a comment saying that, you know, if he's looking at capping them, that's a significant drop in their, you know, their fees they're charging that client. So, um, mm. He's kind of just asking for any, have you, have you seen advice businesses do this? How have they gone about it? Yeah. So um, I have seen quite a few businesses that have gone down the route of saying we have a retainer. So this is, this is a flat fee for the work that we do. And we're going to apply a small asset based fee to the fund that we manage. Not because we say we are going to be the gurus, but we do know that there's a bit more risk involved. There's a bit more work involved with higher sums of money, blah, blah, blah. But that percentage amount might be, you know, 0 0.2 or, or, or 0.25, um, but that, and there's no cap on it. So, or, you know, although then again, I was with an advisor yesterday and he, if there's less than a million bucks farm, I think they charge 0 0.25, anything over a million, they charge 0.15. But again, it's uncapped. Um, so the client can see the specific connection to the revenue with the, the amount of money you're managing. And the irony of it is, 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 you, you could have two clients that have got $3 million portfolios. One's an absolute tight ass and just wants to screw you down on price all the way. And the other one is quite happy to pay for great advice. So they don't care about it. The one thing I would say when you're saying that would take a big hit on revenue if we put a cap on it. Um, a lot of the businesses that we work with, when they work out their pricing model, they don't necessarily go back and cut the fees to their existing clients. Because a lot of those clients are the ones that already see value. If they're paying those fees, they're more than happy to continue to do so um, and they see value in that relationship. You just want to make damn sure that you're still servicing them really well so they're not knocking on somebody else's door and you don't know about it. Um, but then it might just be a model for the new clients that you're bringing on board. And it comes back to this planning thing, setting your intention around what is the EBIT that I'm looking for, you know, what is it that I'm trying to achieve out of this business so then the new business that you're bringing on, you're not having to add more and more staff or you're not having to cut your price and then chew into your EBIT just because you think you have to do that to win over clients. It's about a, an intentional planning around what you're trying to achieve. So, yeah, in terms of that, you may not have a cap on, on the physical dollar amount, but you might bring it down to a lower percentage um, for higher levels of fun. Um, and, yeah, you may not change, you know, significantly the clients that are already working with you. And people then say, but hang on, how about what if they see that what we're charging new clients? Yes, you have to disclose your pricing model in your FSG, but nine times out of 10, most of the pricing models, it depends on the client in terms of how they're applied in terms of the physical dollar amount at the end of the day. So, you know, you don't have to necessarily put every iteration of your pricing model in the FSG. And, and how many clients are reading the FSGs in, uh, in detail? Not very many. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I doubt it. I doubt it. Well, so um, what do you reckon, Phil? Are we, um, are we getting towards, I don't know how much, how much time do we have left, Phil? Let's keep going with yeah. questions. Um, yeah. So Mark Rottenstein said, I'm heading towards not providing implementation unless they take up ongoing. Can positioners pay for implementation, get first years ongoing first, or uh, joining ongoing and the implementation is included? So... Did, did that question make sense? Yeah, I think what he's saying there is, is just having an ongoing fee that's flat for each year. But the challenge with that is that first year when you do actually the implementation, that's a shitload of work um, that isn't going to be repeated in the second year. The other thing to think about, um, are you guys using teleunderwriting by the insurers? I do. Yeah, I am. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so... Yeah. Always, yeah, because it, so it, it doesn't necessarily mean that if they do have to go to PMR and it's a big pain in the neck about all the underwriting and chasing all that up, you're not the one actually chasing it up. Um, it's the insurance provider. So that might mean that you don't have as many hours invested in that client before you find that you're not going to get covered, but it also might mean that the likelihood of it getting covered, if the insurer is asking too many questions, the client can't be bothered 
they don't understand why they have to do it. They can't be bothered and then it falls over and it doesn't get implemented. So, yeah, that's interesting. So Mark's saying mean initial then implementation only. Oh, okay. So you'll only that's, implement. That's actually what I've recently done too. So, uh, okay. yeah, I made the call. At, like it wasn't correlating. Instead of having an implementation fee, I didn't want to put another fee on the upfront. How yeah. about I just um, keep those fees but actually ongoing kicks off from the SOA acceptance and yeah. that's, that's how things go. There's no yeah. lock in. If they want to stay as a client, they're staying as a client and then um, and do you do it that the first year on. is a higher amount and then second year onwards drops back a bit no no it's um it's just yeah it's kicking off and i i get your point around uh, are you seeing yourself up to sort of um show quite a bit of work up front and then maybe not so much ongoing um i i just take that as a challenge to have um the ongoing pretty pretty sound so yeah, it just depends on, again, if they're a risk-only client or if they're, you know, doing everything. Um, yeah. Well, I guess from my proposition, it tends to be a very, like there's a base standard of service that goes in that covers quite a broad range of things. So it's I'm yeah. able to do that from that standpoint. So, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so... Sorry, just to yeah. interrupt um, your one-on-one -on -one session with Patty, uh, we've got some <laughs> more questions. Um, <laughs> Mitch Bradshaw's asked about time-based billing or time based ah, don't do it don't go near it don't go well no let me clarify that don't do it as your sole um pricing model unless you really want to turn yourself into an accountant and like um timesheets don't do it um the yeah you could do it as saying um my fee is this much and it will cover up into a certain point and it might mean the number of hours it might mean you know, know the number of weeks because sometimes people just hold up and actually sending forms back to you a bit hard if it's the doctor holding up but you know and then you might say look if we do more than that then we will put you on an hourly rate and we will charge you by the hour over and above that um, or it might be we use an hourly rate to do our claims management process because we only want to charge you what it costs to do it rather than you know whatever and we don't know how deep this hole is going to get um, but in terms of having it as a full model this is how I charge you're just not going to get the leverage that you are able to get in an advice business if you do that because you will always be linked to the number of hours that you work and from a client's perspective um you know you get paid more the more incompetent you are so um that they might not necessarily see that you're going to be as efficient as possible and do such an awesome job because you make more money if you are slow i think the accounting uh, industry is a good example of uh how that's gone they're all trying to migrate towards a retainer fee, so yeah a lot of them are a lot of them are. And, you know, I've, I've worked in a chat at a accounting firm and they do all their timesheets and then the partners get together at the end of the month and they go, oh, that doesn't sound right. Oh, we can't charge them that. We're going to write off this. And it's like, well, why bother even taking a timesheet at all? It's just about, yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. so we're, we're kind of starting to run over, but we're getting, we're getting questions. People love talking about pricing. So uh, we're going to keep on pushing on for another five, ten minutes. Um, Can we go to five? Because I, I have actually got a client. Five minutes. <laughs> All right, no worries. Who's actually um, coming from a client office uh, today? She's um, yeah. I didn't want to do this because I I know anybody that likes football, but I love my uh, my clients here. But they're Dockers fans, and there's an orange wall there, so that's why I'm in front of the blind because it was going to clash. So I want to distract you. Patty, oh, that's question, pricing. The wall's going to be in the Please? business plan, is it, so? <laughs> Patty, there's a there's a question for you just about your ongoing service, uh, and and how that works. You were talking about with your pricing model? Yeah, yeah. So it's just, it's sort of, it's, it's two-sided. It's sort of preventing the, um, the ten, like the leaning towards a transaction um, by some clients that haven't seen the full value of advice yet and gets them into that, um, into the ongoing advice space. And it also, my ongoing includes all the implementation. So all the paid work needs to be done whenever is done in the, so that's just sort of as part of the general um, ongoing service. So it just syncs yeah. in with that. So that's, that's when you do a review, if there's new advice to be written, if it has been ROA or SOA, that's all included. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, so SOA, when you... I, if there's something significant, that's how I position it. If, if, if there's a significant change that wasn't yeah. in the previous SOA, then it's something new that is being added yeah. to it. So when you play with your numbers there, you and you actually come up with how much are you going to set your fee at, you kind of have to assume that each review is going to have X amount of follow-up work some of them will, some of them won't, but you need to build it in there. Otherwise, you're not going not gonna to be pricing well. 
Yeah, so that's for myself and my business. Um, like Ro Mark Rottenstein said, I um, charge an ongoing monthly fee and I'm looking at how do I just not have any upfront fee. So I still charge an upfront fee that's still quite minimal. Um, mm -hmm. But how do I ch how do I remove that completely um, and just charge an ongoing fee? Um, and yeah, I've I've priced it so I understand that every review meeting I'm I'm likely to do some work, um, whether it is a full ROA or or just some you know financial projections for them. Um, I understand that that's um, that's the kind of work that's involved with my reviews. Yeah, great. Great. So I'll, I'll keep you updated with how I'm going, Mark. Um, I'm not brave enough to do that just yet, but um, but I'm looking at how do I do it. Well, this is a yeah. great chance to plug the Facebook page. Um, there's been some great discussion around fees on there. Um, if everyone, everyone, anyone's joined the Facebook page and hasn't seen that yet, just scroll down and you'll find some um, examples of fee schedules that Phil and I have both shared mine, and as well as some other advisors. Um, and yeah, get them get amongst it. That's really good. Um, yeah, that's a great comment from Mark. Not charging initial advice means you're selling initial advice as a loss leader. Yes and no, you could still be building in the cost of that initial service into your first year's retainer. It doesn't mean that you have to be giving your advice away. It's just about the way that you structure the timing of the fee. And I would say to you too, and I'm, I'm guessing you're not, not doing this, Phil, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be positioning it to a client to say, I'm going to do your advice for free because you're going to be worth more to me. That's kind of the old way of looking at it, saying, well, if I get you as a client, you'll be worth more to me over the long term. It's more around saying, I am structuring my pricing model so that I can smooth that out for your cash flow. But you might need to say it's a minimum 12-month engagement. You can't cancel it within the 12 months because what you're paying for in 10 months' time is the work that I'm going to be doing in the next two weeks. Yeah, so I mean, I, I tell my clients that my business is worth more as you being a client. So all good. No, I'm just kidding. I don't do that at all. Um, <laughs> I, I do I do a minimum of 12 months for my clients, um, and I, I do that now, even though I charge them an upfront fee. Um, so, but I do a rolling advice as well. So I don't just do uh, here's one big super cash flow investments um, insurance. I kind of I try and roll it so and and I start my ongoing fee from when they sign up I don't worry yeah. until I get all the information provide an SOA because I do you know a lot of work in the kind of month potentially before I do you know provide an SOA so I might do like an insurance and super just so they're covered and and their supers looked after um SOA and then you know after they go through the whole underwriting process and want to kill me then I go and say all right now this is the exciting stuff let's look at more you know investments or whatever so that's, yeah, and that's that works I'm really right. well when you when you your beginning part of it is about setting their whole project plan and saying this is all about you and building the life you want articulate that this is the life we want to get you towards here's step one and once we do step one we'll talk about step two so yeah still bat the kneecaps to them if they want to leave before 12 months <laughs> In reality, what, what happens if they want to leave before 12 months is up? Uh, for me, uh, they, they sign an agreement saying that they, they they want to do 12 months. And have you ever had anyone want to pull out before 12? Uh, no. No, I've had someone pull out after 12 months, like uh, mm -hmm. like at, at month 14, um, and they, they wanted to move towards more of a transactional advice model. So they... It still probably works out to be the same amount of um, revenue I, I generate from those clients, but they just wanted to have a do some financial modeling and, you know, it's an engineer. So he's like full geeks out on Excel spreadsheets that I build for him. Um, so that's, they're more transactional, um, but it, it still works. It works for them. Awesome. Right. Okay. But well, so you've got your, your client to go see. We don't want to um, impact that relationship. <laughs> Um, so I was just trying to type in here uh, to a comment to everyone and I can't. Oh, yes, I can. There you go. So I've dropped my email address and that's my personal email address in the chat box there. So if anybody does want to get, um, take advantage of that offer, email me. Awesome. Awesome. Thank yeah, you very uh, much. Take advantage of it, guys. And me and Patty are talking over each other again. Um, so next week, guys, we've got uh, Mark Nagel, and I will find a link to that um, to that webinar. So next week, we've got Mark Nagel, and it's going to be a great session. We are talking about uh, leaving value on the table, so how advisors aren't, um, you know, showing their clients as much value as possible, uh, and they may not be generating as much revenue as they could be. Um, so it's going to be a great... Yeah, I would say go 
for that one for sure. Mark's really great, got lots of value, and they are hitting a killer EBIT in their firm, which he'll probably share with you. So lots of stuff to learn from Mark. We'll no doubt hit him up about that. So everyone, make sure you join the Facebook group. Uh, it's it's absolutely kicking goals. We've uh, had another you know 50 people join in the last week, uh, and there's great conversations going on in there. So we I put a link in there before. Uh, so make sure you join the Facebook group. Thanks again, Sue, for joining us. You're our first return guest. Uh, and thank you so much for your generosity in, in sharing your offers. No worries at all. Absolute pleasure. Awesome. <laughs> Have a fantastic week, everyone. And we'll see you in the Facebook group. Bye. Bye.